For 40 years, Vancouver developed without government planning. The Canadian Pacific Railway laid out Vancouver's streets before the city government existed. The London-based BC Electric Company chose the arterial streets to maximize riders on its streetcars. London was the model, where order came from human interaction, not human design. Robert Horn Payne, founder of BC Electric Company, sold it in 1928 and died shortly after. That same year, Harlan Bartholomew presented his radical Plan for Vancouver, claiming cities are better designed by planners than by natural processes. He had been the first full-time planner in the U.S. advising on freeways and slums. Mayor L.D. Taylor, originally of Chicago, endorsed him, though many had wanted someone from the Commonwealth who understood British institutions. The British discretionary system is principle-based. It starts with what cannot be built. Everything else is possible. The United States regulatory system is rule-based. It starts with what can be built. Everything else is not possible. The U.S. system was top-down, originating in Bismarck's Germany. The British system was bottom-up, incremental, organic. British philosophers like Alan Turing, an inventor of the computer, were emergentists. He described how complex structures assemble themselves without a designer. Jane Jacobs was influenced by the British emergentists and wrote, no logic can be superimposed on cities. People make it. Ants, termites, and computer algorithms all produce unexpected emergent order in large numbers. When tiny polyps achieve critical mass, they create coral reefs. When humans achieve critical mass, they adopt a distinctive density gradient to benefit the greatest number of people. Designed cities do not have this gradient. For example, a Soviet city like Moscow or the completely planned Brasilia. Bartholomew installed planning regimes in hundreds of mid-sized U.S. cities. He had just finished his work with Peoria, Illinois, when he moved his operation to Vancouver. Bartholomew's plan and over a dozen supplementary reports to council documented the already efficient, organic Vancouver. He wrote, its history is like topsy, it just growed. His own scientific contributions were less persuasive, like to move all public buildings to one civic center, reduce Falls Creek to a 200 meter wide shipping channel, build up to 13 airports, line the banks of the Fraser River with industry, drive diagonals through neighborhoods to link streets, and dam the second narrows for a freshwater harbor. His decision to rezone the healthy Strathcona neighborhood industrial would lead to deterioration, but would also protect it from Bartholomew's plan. Bartholomew's plan includes common sense suggestions to expedite car traffic and provide civic services, but his major focus was on his distributor connector, a 10-lane highway through the middle of downtown, Robson over a new Falls Creek Bridge, connecting to Kingsway with spurs to Burrard and Pender. A freeway before the word was coined. Vancouver neighborhood streets typically have 66-foot rights-of-way with 24 to 30 feet of actual road. Bartholomew wanted a dozen streets doubled in width to eight or 10 lanes and a six block elevated road between Burrard and Arbutus. His plan mandated a landscaped pleasure drive up to 200 feet wide for cars around almost the entire waterfront, beach parking for 1,000 cars and five additional drives crisscrossing the city. The introduction to his plan emphasizes the absence of skyscrapers and Vancouver as a city of single family homes. The model for Vancouver shifted symbolically from London to Peoria. Vancouver would swing between the UK and the US models ever since. Bartholomew set up planning commissions, but he wanted them called plan commissions. Cities should adhere to his plan, not spend time tinkering with it, and only periodically make changes. Vancouver's town planning commission was a main planning body from the 1920s to the 1950s. 
it tried to preserve the West End near Stanley Park for large single houses only. Bartholomew wanted participation in the planning process and created advisory committees of up to 100 people. The three-person Zoning Board of Appeal challenged the U.S. model. In the first 18 months, Vancouverites launched 250 appeals. Bartholomew criticized the board, recommending its powers be reduced and that it have five members. In time, these were implemented. The name was changed to the Board of Variants. The U.S. regulatory model envisioned giving land use power to planning commissions and making it difficult for city councils to deviate from their plan. Vancouver rejected this and maintained British political culture. It refused to adopt a plan and never integrated the commission into the city structure. In early Vancouver, Alexander Street was preferred by the wealthiest. But with growth, they moved to the West End and built numerous mansions. Growth pressures followed and they decamped to a new neighborhood, Shaughnessy. Today, only one of those original mansions remains. But Shaughnessy sought protection from the free market with one of the world's earliest zoning laws, an act of the BC legislature that kept out uses other than single houses. Bartholomew endorsed exclusionary aspects of zoning. In the US, he claimed that zoning could prevent movement into finer residential districts by colored people. Zoning froze the previously fluid boundaries right where they were in the 1920s. They have barely moved in the 100 years since. Almost all Vancouver houses had been built by speculators or on spec. What the market wanted in the early 1900s, planners would mandate as the only allowable form for over 100 years. Bartholomew's first zoning bylaw had only three districts, detached residential that excluded most uses, apartments with some uses the detached zone didn't want, and the unrestricted zone with everything else. He described it as temporary, largely to prevent intrusion of apartment houses into residential areas. The full bylaw had 10 districts. Anything less than a 40-foot house lot was considered too small and needed an approving officer. Bartholomew initially wanted all downtown buildings limited to six stories. But for commercial buildings, he compromised at 10 stories. When it was revealed that the Vancouver Charter already allowed 18 stories, he compromised again, but with tight restrictions. The 22-story Marine Building slipped in before Bartholomew could stop it. Before zoning, homeowners on streetcar lines built stores on their front yards, creating the shopping streets that define our neighborhoods. Some of the original houses can still be seen. Bartholomew ended this practice. Streets like Main, Fraser, and Victoria have intensive retail up to the original streetcar stops. Extensions to these lines and streets that got transit after zoning, like Knight, Camby, and McDonald, have almost no retail at all. Bartholomew stopped corner stores and cafes within residential areas, which he claimed caused considerable damage. If they ceased operating for just one month, the city would close them permanently. After 100 years, only a handful of these much-loved businesses still remain. Bartholomew clamped down on existing shopping streets, workshops, print shops, and laundries were no longer allowed. Restaurants were allowed, but not if they had music and dancing. Vancouver's once vital neighborhoods under the London model became deserts of U.S.-style suburban monotony. Urbanists call this effect the dead hand of planning. Before zoning, if a homeowner thought more housing was needed, they would simply build an apartment. This quick response ensured the price of housing remained affordable. Bartholomew ended this and limited apartment buildings to six stories. The taller Sylvia had been built before zoning. Bartholomew noted when he arrived that Vancouver had low car ownership, but the new neighborhoods no longer had shopping and services close by, 
and the old neighborhoods had lost variety. Residents now needed cars to meet their needs. With the additional driving, minimum parking standards were imposed throughout the city. Bartholomew railed against stores that went right to the property line. Setbacks, parking, and open space requirements combined to give us the strip mall. Retailers avoided planning rules with indoor shopping malls, where businesses recreated what cities used to provide naturally. Indoor malls and big box stores replicate walkable shopping streets. Zoning prevented natural densification. Large parts of the Fraser Valley were paved over. Younger families had to drive farther to find homes. Bartholomew's zoning locked in sprawl, the world's largest source of carbon emissions. Vancouver had embraced zoning more enthusiastically than planning. In his last report, Bartholomew reminded council he had asked them to impose a two-third vote to deviate from his plan. He lamented that in 22 years, no councillor had even attempted to approve the plan. Perhaps because the year after, the world entered a 10-year depression, making his plan obsolete. Even Shaughnessy, which had started zoning, was called Poverty Hill, as mansions were confiscated for taxes and owners illegally converted them to rooming houses to try to cover their mortgages. Eventually, 30% of all Shaughnessy homes became rooming houses, but zoning justified removing this affordable housing once the economy recovered. Vancouver's relationship with Bartholomew effectively ended when the city council refused to reimburse him for his travel. Vancouver turned to someone from the British Commonwealth for its next phase of development. Gerald Sutton Brown, our first chief planner, born and raised in Jamaica, worked in northern England, would bring back elements of the British discretionary model more sensitive to natural processes and market forces.